All right, guys, how are you? Dr. Joy Michelle Martin here, and I have with me the most fabulous person ever. If you have not seen her website, you need to go see it, UC Logic. Um, Dr. Uchenna Osai, otherwise known as UC, and she is amazing. She's like super brilliant. She is like, this is why I wanted to talk to her because she's just amazing. Oh my so. goodness. You are way, 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 way too kind. Uh, thank you. I'm really excited to chat and talk about, you know, all of the things. Yeah. So you are a sex, um, a sex certified sex, mm -hmm. sex therapist or sex counselor? What, what is the correct terminology? Yeah, it's a sex counselor, right? So the sex therapist can, is only a mental health professional. So a sexuality counselor is essentially someone that can be able, is able to counsel the patient regarding sexual issues, regarding all the sexual issues short of, you know, mental health or psych, who, short of people who need intensive psychological therapy. Okay. So doctor, nurse, physical therapist, priest, you name it. Okay. Sounds good. And now tip, and you also work clinically still seeing a lot of patients um, for pelvic health. Are you seeing just women or are you seeing men, women, and kids? Yeah, so um, historically, I, you know, when I started my career, I saw people, people of all genders. And recently, I moved to Austin last summer, and I um, accepted a position at UT Health Austin uh, Dell Medical School, where I'm an assistant professor for the Department of Women's Health. And this is the first job that I've had where I exclusively see women, which has been mm. a very extra, extra special experience for me in a positive way. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I see patients uh, full time as well as I'm the um, pelvic health program manager for UT Health Austin um, as well. So I and have. You, and you see why I think you're so brilliant? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I'm very happy to spread my wings the way I have my career and, you know, kind of chase the things that interest me. So I've been very lucky and I've had wonderful people along the way who've guided me. So. I'm awesome. that. Awesome. Now with the patients that you're seeing, a lot of the women, what percentage is pelvic pain um, of those patients? About 50, 40, 40 to 50%. Okay. And a lot of them, are they having um, a lot of issues? Is sexual um, dysfunction one of their primary complaints as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And when I talk about sexual health, like I really want to talk about all genders, right? Because I mean, for the first, gosh, seven years of my career, I saw men, women, gender nonconforming individuals, trans patients, you name it, and everyone struggled with sexual functioning, no matter what their diagnosis. Sexual function is always a component of um, pelvic health, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think for me, primarily seeing a lot of pregnant and postpartum women, I don't think a lot of people understand the role that um, sexual health and sexual function plays in life and, and, and with them and with their health. And, you know, I know we were talking earlier and I have a lot of patients who will say, you know, I'm just doing this because I have to have a baby, but sex hurts. Right. And, and they think that that's okay. And they think that that's normal. And I'm like, no. <laughs> No, it's right. not. No, it's not. You, there is help. I'm glad you called me. I'm glad we can get this sorted out. And let's get you on a path to healing. You know, even a lot of women complain of things like vaginal dryness after sex, or if they're premenopausal or perimenopausal, you know, or they've gone through menopause already, and they're complaining of things like vaginal dryness, or they're having difficulties with, with intercourse and stuff like that. Now, how, how do you typically um, integrate your pelvic health um, with the sexual counseling? Well, I think the thing about it is what we all have to understand with when it comes to sexuality and sexual expression and sexual health um, is that sex is an indicator of your overall health. Mm -hmm. So if someone is having sexual dysfunction, they're less likely to perceive themselves as truly healthy, right? If you're looking at, if someone says, oh, like, do you perceive yourself as healthy? Well, sort of, yeah. right? And it's very important, but I think there's also a component where we overlook the fact that our sexual development starts in infancy, right? In childhood. 
And the sociocultural cues that we get um, in the society that we are raised in, that we grow up in, that we are you know, living in, really um, has a very strong influence on how we express ourselves sexually and how we express our sexual functioning as well as sexual dysfunctioning. And so I try to first educate patients about that fact, right? And so in, you know, in my intake, even with a patient who has, comes in with prolapse, right? I, ask, I talk, talk to them about bowel. I talk to them about urinary function, but then I ask them about their sexual function. And I explain why. You know, like, are you sexually active? Yes, okay. Like, you know, are you having pain with sex? Are you, you having difficulty with orgasm? Are you having incontinence? You know, and I ask these questions and then, you know, I normalize it because these are questions that really any mm-hmm. writer should be asking at baseline, you know, are you sexually active? Are there any, are there any challenges with your sexual functioning? You know, if, this, if someone says, a patient tells me that, they're having difficulty achieving orgasm or they never achieved an orgasm and they're quite distressed by it, then that's, that's a problem. And that's something that we need to address. And Mm -hmm. one of the components, one of the reasons why I decided to seek additional training is because, you know, I did my residency, my women's health, pelvic health residency at Wash U and I I was so blessed to learn amongst all these geniuses, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, I did all this extra post, graduation training in addition to the residency. And I still was thinking, I don't know a lot about sex. I know a lot about sex from my personal experience, but I don't know about it from a didactic, clinical, academic perspective that I can apply clinically for my patients who are really suffering. Right. And I chose to do the University of Michigan program. And it was there that I learned that really, I just start with educating my patients. I just start by education and just kind of figuring out where they're at normalizing the fact that sexual dysfunction is a common problem in this country, particularly among women and go from there. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's so common with anybody who works in pelvic health because, you know, like I tell people, if I can walk into a room and say pee, poop and sex and people not go, Oh my God, you know, I feel like we've come far (laughs) because you know, most people just, they're like, Oh my God. Well, it's funny because there is a study that showed that 86% of patients prefer their healthcare provider to initiate the conversation. Mm-hmm. What we forget is that our healthcare providers are human beings too, and they have their own sexual issues, right? Mm-hmm. They have their own sexual beliefs. So they themselves may not be comfortable asking because they're not comfortable with it. With it. Right? And so that's something that you know, healthcare uh, training programs, physical therapy, dentistry, medicine, you name it, need to really get their students comfortable with asking these questions and comfortable enough to hearing the responses. It's one thing to be comfortable enough to ask a question. It's another thing to be comfortable enough to hear the response and respond Mm -hmm. (laughs) to sharing with you. And and that's, that's where I got stuck. It wasn't that I was uncomfortable. I just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how to address this properly. I need more training. (laughs) And to be unbiased, because like you said, we have a very diverse population. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not just male, female. We have um, sexual reassignment surgeries. Now, you know, we've got Mm -hmm. uh, an increasing um, population that we now know of, whereas before people would say, well, I didn't know of um, LBGT and so on. And so we have to be respectful of persons and we have to be inclusive. And it's, you know, it's one thing to, to treat an individual and say, all right, well, you know, I have to ask these questions because, you know, that's kind of my training, but to be, to be mindful and to hold space for those people and to really understand and empathize with them because they may be having issues too. And not just put your your feelings and opinions onto them. So I mean, it's it's really it's a tough juggle for some people. It shouldn't it be, but mm-hmm. it is. I think, but I think it's also a product of our society, right? And how we're raised, and how 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 we're raised, what what we're around, what we're used to. You know, like I was, I was, I grew up in a Nigerian household in Dallas, Texas, you know, and I went to all 
private school from age five to 18. So <laughs> that shapes what, how, what your comfort level is, right? But if you're, if you're exposed to different things and it's normalized for you, it's easier to at least have the conversation. And I think that's where a lot, particularly women are mm-hmm. at an advantage, right? Because with bo- little boys, you know, they masturbate and you say, okay, that's fine. Just do that behind closed doors and you know, do you. But when a girl, when you discover your daughter masturbating, there's a visceral shame and, you know, I don't want her to get pregnant. I don't want her to become a Jezebel. I don't want, you know, like all these things. And it gets layered onto this little child. Mm -hmm. We learn, oh, sexual exploration is bad. And a lot of people say, well, there's religious context to that. And I'm like, of course, Mm -hmm. like you have conservative religious values and still be sex positive. Mm-hmm. Still, you know, teach your child um, about their bodies, their their own constitution with their bodies, consent. Those concepts are are very um, universal, mm-hmm. right? and the concept of pleasure. And again, you know, when you have people who have chronic pelvic pain, incontinence, um, fecal incontinence, fe- urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, prolapse body image can be impacted right but if you're already thinking like sex sex is oh you know something Mm -hmm. stories and then you have this other added component to it that can really just people just say okay i'm out thank you thanks for playing (laughs) right yeah i mean all too often it's just not something that like you said people want to talk about and and I think, you know, for a lot of our patients, they just don't know where to start. I don't even think that many people, you know, as a pelvic health therapist, I do come into contact with quite a lot of people, but there's so many people that I don't. And there's so many people that other pelvic therapists don't come into contact with. And I still hear on a daily basis, I had no idea that you guys exist. I had no idea that you guys did all this stuff. I had no idea that you could help these things because I just thought this was normal. So I became a woman and I had a child and I'm supposed to leak because that's what you do when you become a woman and when you have children. And as you get older, you just pee on yourself. I mean, that's, you know, or, you know, you have children and that's all that sex is for. So you're not supposed to enjoy it. And, you know, it is what it is. And so that's the mentality of a lot of people, which is really unfortunate. And so I feel like, you know, this is why I enjoy talking to you and talking to other therapists and other individuals who are in this field, because, you know, it's so important to get the message out and get the word out and help people to know and be aware that, right. hey, you don't have to like suffer in silence. You know, there are people that can help you and, and things that can be done to get you on a path to healing. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think too, um, you know, and again, depending on who's, who's kind of looking at this video, mm-hmm. healthcare provider there's a lot of bias training you have to do before you can do the sex work, right? Before you can do this, the sexual counseling. Mm -hmm. No, I had to do a lot of work to say like, what are my biases when it comes to sexuality? You know, like, what are my, Oh, like, you know what? That's a little bit, that's my limit. I hit my limit, but here's someone that can go further with you in this journey. Right. Understanding where that is. It's almost, it's it's implicit bias training, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, do implicit bias training with um, race, sexual orientation, body sizing, all of that. Like you have to do that with sex. And say, okay, you know what? What? What can I be potentially be putting onto my patient that has nothing to do with them and everything to do with me? Mm-hmm. And so, doing that work first and really understanding that and knowing your history about the patient you have, because sexual health, it, you have to look at it from a biopsychosocial model. There's biological components, there's psychological components, there's sociocultural components, mm-hmm. and personal components, right? So if you're, if you're seeing a patient who's coming to you with urinary incontinence, but, you know, is gender nonconforming, African-American, first generation, uh, you know, like, mm-hmm. there's some stuff, right? And they have endo, and mm-hmm. you know, they're there's some stuff that we have to kind of recognize and it's like, where do you, where do you focus your attention? Well, I know it. Mm-hmm. right. And asking questions, being aware of your bias, that's where you kind of can meet your patient in the middle and where they feel fully cared for. 
Mm -hmm. And you've done a lot of work with people, with women, um, with different communities who are more marginalized relative to the rest of the population. What, what biases and, and what things are you seeing out there still as it relates to, you know, women and the talks of sex and, you know, transgenders and the talks of sex and, you know, especially now where we're having, thank goodness, we're having a lot more education, especially with pelvic health too, on like a lot of the surgeries and surgical procedures and different things of that sort. And we, we have the ability to impact that, but there's so many other people in the community um, so many other clinicians, you know, outside of us that may come into contact with all these individuals and they are, you know. Well, you know, I always tell people this, like everyone's like, oh, like what's the secret to like working with trans patients? Like, yeah, you need to know the clinical component. You need to know the surgical pieces, but not all of your patients are going to have surgery, right? right? Thinking specifically about this patient population. It's really about understanding the, the, <laughs> the social determinants of health mm -hmm. and what does that mean for my patients like you know you need to know okay who's a good who's a safe accountant who's a safe dentist who's a safe realtor who's a safe attorney like those are the things that are those microaggressions that make people transgender individuals or individuals who are trans at the highest medical risk in this country because they have to deal with it all. They get it from all angles, all sides. right? And then, and then you can add race on top of that. And it's like, so it'll take us a weekend to learn the surgeries, all right? So everyone, like it'll take you a weekend to learn it, get it, establish a great relationship with a surgeon who knows what they're doing and you'll learn a lot. But the real work is understanding the federal regional, local <laughs> components that impact their day-to-day -day life. Things like housing, right? Most states don't even have protections for individuals when it comes to housing. It doesn't matter if they work at a top 10 law firm. Wow. If their landlord finds out that they are trans. They have every right to kick them out that night by midnight. They get home at 1159, they're out. So those are things that as healthcare providers, we need to be aware of. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just about what, what manip can I do yeah. this trans patient. No, right? Bones are bones, muscles are muscles. And, and I think that we need to apply that to everything else, right? We, we, we want our patients to have the audacity to seek out good care, but we ourselves have to challenge, have to challenge our comfort zones. Mm -hmm. We have to stretch ourselves a little bit. Well, a lot of the times that's what we are because we, huh, you said what? I have no idea if I answered your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think so a lot of times, you know, or at least for myself, um, as a, as a clinician, I see my role as being an advocate for the patient, you know, whether it's, you know, like I said, I work primarily with pregnant and postpartum women. And for me, trying to bring more awareness, bring more education, you know, um, within my community, trying to connect with people who can help people within the community, um, underserved moms, different things like that, because there's so, so much work to be done. And I think regardless of whatever, you know, subspecialty within pelvic health that we work in, we need to see ourselves as advocates. Yes. Because, you know, that's, that's truly our role. Like we are the go-between between everybody for our patients. Like we're the person who's supposed to facilitate their best health and help them to kind of navigate that because, you know, we might know a lot, like you said, a lot of the clinical stuff and we may know who they need to go to medically, but we also need to be aware of, you know, social implications, you know, if they've got financial implications, if they've got psychological that, you know, if they've got stressors that are compounding everything else that they've got going on, um, like we really have to kind of help them navigate that. So it's just, it's more than just, yeah, let's go lay hands on this one. Let's go lay hands right? on that one. You know, it's way more than that. Well, it's funny because, um, you know, when you think about the pregnant postpartum superstars and their partners, mm -hmm. what, what this whole process does to your sexuality, right? And like, 
does it. Some, for some people, it brings it up to the surface. And you're like, yay! You know, because, you know, some people, they just like, they're like, yes, I found my sexual self during my pregnancy. And then some people are like, wow, you know, my, like, I didn't have sex for nine months. Um, I was sick. I wasn't feeling good. Or I just knew, like, oh, I get a break. Mm-hmm. Right? From feeling the guilt of providing for your partner. And that's where the work has to start. You know, typically I'm seeing patients postpartum and for primary, for other issues that are primary, right? So back pain, pelvic girdle pain, pubic symphysis, you you know the drill, right? Um, Incontinence, things like that. But then, you know, I always ask about the sexual component. And sometimes, you know, when you have a, a beautiful little nugget on your boob, and you've had two hours of sleep, you're not really ready to like talk about like when you learned about sex. Mm-hmm. My back hurts. I'm leaking everywhere. I need to get that and handled. And I handle that. But I also say that sex thing, when you're ready, we can talk about it. If you're ready now, great, we'll do it now. If you're ready in six months, we'll do it in six months. But I always put that availability because bandwidth is a thing, right? particularly postpartum. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, but, but almost kind of creating this environment like you have the right to have pleasurable sex. You have the right to have a libido that is adequate according to your standards. Mm-hmm might change depending on the season of life that you are in mm-hmm. right and the the roller coaster ride that you have with your partner or partners you know those are things that are real it's not this tr- traditional like boom boom like it should be like this everyone mm-hmm. feel fluid when it comes to that and oh, yeah and normalizing that and that's what i spend a lot of time saying like this hey boo you may not be feeling your your person <laughs> your partner right now Mm -hmm. it's okay right we you know if you have the bandwidth to be about that and explore that great i will help you with that if you don't cool we'll just address the things you came in for but know that this is something that you have you have the right to pain-free intercourse you have the right to have um, a strong libido right? You have a right to sexual pleasure. You have the same right that men do. Mm -hmm. Because the only people that like sex are men, right? Right. Right. (laughs) I mean, I had like a crazy Nigerian mother who was like super Catholic and it's like, don't have sex till you're married, but it should be pleasurable if you have sex. Yes, darling. You know, so I'm just like, what? I'm confused. (laughs) super confused from age like I'm pretty sure like nine to like 18 like what was mom's thing you know but (laughs) but that was my environment right I had a a chemist mother who was hardcore catholic (laughs) very much like don't have sex to be married but sex should be pleasurable you own your body consent is a thing that we that is very paramount to everything Mm -hmm. right that that was my life and i was born into that lottery of you know mount kilimanjaro luck level luck with my mother but she she is super proud of what she produced (laughs) i i hope so (laughs) i I think i absolutely think that she would be i hope so but i i think that you know, it was her that allowed me to normalize being a sexual person for me. Even though we had conservative religious foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was my experience. And I'm not going to impose that on anybody else. But that's what I come with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. For, me, the, for me, for me, the gloves came off once that, you know, it was like, okay, you're getting married. So you need to make sure that whatever you did to get him, you need to do it to keep it. And I'm like, mm. who are you? And what did you do to my mother? <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> Wait a minute. Like, who are you? did that just come out of your mouth? She's like, Look, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I mean, you know, 
But you have to, I almost tell my patients, like, you need to be a gangster for yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I feel like if you make it that step to come see me, like, you, you're hood about yourself. And I love, <laughs> you know, like, you're like. You're about that life, man. You're about that life. <laughs> you're about that life. You know, and you should be celebrated. You know, I, I mean, I feel like I need to do a standardized happy dance when, I, when my patients come in. When they've been dealing with this for for decades, like you're a boss. Yes, I tell people all the time. I tell patients all the time. Like my happiest moment is when a patient tells me I had sex and it didn't hurt. Like I had one patient that told me one time she, I got there for her appointment, and um, she says, Jay, I wanted to call you last night. So me now thinking i'm like is something wrong you know did something happen are you okay Uh, no we had sex (laughs) and it was great and i did that thing you said i was like which which thing did i say you know when you said to try more stuff Mm -hmm. and i was like well did you try some stuff she said i tried some Mm -hmm. stuff and i mean her face looked like a christmas tree with every light on in I mean yes queen yes that's when you know you've like you are you've done something when they're like after they like have their sexy time like angels weeping clouds parting and they're like I tell you see I want to tell Jay I got it on right her and I enjoyed myself Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I want to come home and pop champagne. Like, yes, another one. You want to, like, <laughs> rain for yourself because you're awesome. Pew, pew, pew. Right, <laughs> man. I, I I absolutely love what I do. I love what we do and like the effect that we can have on people. I was even telling um, I joke with a lot of I teach a, a pregnancy um, prenatal class, and so I joke a lot of times with the dads, and I'm like, look. This is the stuff, I'm going to tell you the stuff that they're not going to tell you, the nurses and all that stuff for the, that part of the prenatal class. Like, they're not going to talk to you about sex, so let's get down and dirty. And I start passing out, like, samples of lubricant. And I remember the first time I did it, one time I did it in a class, and, like, you look at the men, and I'm like, are y'all, like, wondering why I'm giving y'all lubricant? I'm like, don't try it now, because she might slap you, because she's still got that baby in there. Just, I mean, mm-hmm. try your luck. I can't say what's going to happen. But when that doctor gives her the six week go around, like don't don't let the first thing out of your mouth be, you know, like we are gonna, you know, no, yeah. no, you you know, you kind of kind of like ease your way into that because she might smack you, but yeah. you ease your way into you know pamper yeah, her, her, right? Yes. Pamper her and you know make her feel all good and the and then you see the guys they start to smile and the women are like. Now, now, ladies, if you gotta smack them, don't smack them too hard. I feel bad for them. It could be a drought. You know, they might be suffering. You know how they are. They're not as strong as we are. You know, and it gets them laughing. Nope. But the thing is, it's like you know, I try to get husbands involved because, like, they need to, or spouses for that matter, get them involved because they need to be. Well, and the thing about it, it depends, right? So, like, this is a really fascinating debate, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to go in. Go for it. Part of the problem, right, is that people, particularly women, because society has not created a little safe futon for us to explore our sexual selves, we, we attach it to our partners, mm-hmm. particularly male partners, Right. And our male partner has been given permission to be sexual all they want Mm -hmm. since adolescence. We have been trained to to regress our sexual selves. So, like, you have this. Unless you have, like, someone who's, like, super on point with you, you know, that's a challenge. And I always always tell a lot of my, my patients, let's start with you. Before we worry about your partner's needs, what are your needs? Like, let's develop your sexual self, your sexual likes, your dislikes. What is the difference between intimacy and sex or desire? A lot mm-hmm. of people use those. Mm-hmm. They think sex is intimacy, and it's like way no. more than that. Way no. More than that. Like, let's pull that apart, right? Mm-hmm. Like, desire is like raw, like, 
Mm, like I saw me some Matthew McConaughey and smelled some Old Spice and I was ready to go. I want that. That's like, boom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right? Like, hello. You know, like one of my colleagues saw that movie, what is it, The Star is Born? Oh gosh. He straight up was like, I want to take a bath with Bradley Cooper. And I was like, that's desire, right? That's like, oh, oh. Right? Like, I'm going to feel this in my bones, in my pelvic floor, in my mind. And, and everywhere. Right? Intimacy is what makes us feel safe, what makes us feel secure. Our partner anticipating our needs. You know what? I, I get home at six o'clock. Gosh, it's wonderful that the dry cleaning has been picked up by my partner. Mm-hmm. And I don't have dinner's on the table. Like, that's setting up, it's almost that intimacy, right? Or just saying, oh, you know what, they sent me flowers when they knew that this was going to be a really extra special month. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I tell people that foreplay starts after the last time you have sex, but it's only going to work if your partner understands themselves sexually. Mm -hmm. At least it's like 50% there. But if they're not even understanding their own sexual self, you could do everything perfect and it's not going to come to fruition. And it's not because of you. It's not because of them. It's just because we haven't been taught how to do it. It hasn't been, it hasn't been modeled for us, mm-hmm. particularly women. Yeah, because you can't have sex. And if you touch boys, you're going to get pregnant. If you look at boys, you're right? going to get pregnant. Right. You, and you, you don't want to be Jezebel. You mm-hmm. don't want to make the family look bad. And, yeah. You know? I mean, I remember my mom was like, just make sure you never, like, I don't have to bail you out of jail. You know, that was like her thing. (laughs) Like, I don't embarrass me. And I never want to ever bail you out of jail. And that was like the thing that resonated in my ear. Right. But she wasn't, if she said, don't ever get pregnant. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, sex is sex is for your for your husband which which for a lot of religions that is a valid component Mm -hmm. but you can imagine you tell you tell someone for from from the minute they can think independently your body is for god be be for god be for god and then all of a sudden they have to all this transition to their husband Mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that which can be a challenge people not all but for for a good yeah, for a lot of people <clears throat> i remember meeting a lady who said to me when she was young that her mother told her you know if you kiss a boy you'll get pregnant mm. and so she didn't kiss the boy she had sex with the boy mm. right because <laughs> if you kiss the boy you get pregnant, get pregnant. and so sure enough when she got pregnant her yes. mother was about to kill her and like you know other family had to step in she had to go live with other family and stuff like that and i'm like you know it it's so sad because you have to be transparent with your kids you know even even if you are from you know you have specific values or you have a specific culture within your home you know if if you it can't be kind of like a do as I say, not as I do. It should be all around. And it shouldn't just be like a dictator, you know, but, but help, help them to understand, especially kids. Cause it's like, the more you tell them don't do something, the more they're going to go do. Well, and I think it's again, normalizing that sex is like an urge, you know, mm-hmm. children, and you don't have to say sex. You can say, these are your genitals. Like you can talk to them about consent very early on. Mm-hmm being this scary thing it's not going to change their innocence right it's not going to change their view of the world it just simply is not right and so i'm I, not a crazy mom for walking around and showing my kids the pelvic model and going no, show me where your vagina <laughs> no <laughs> you my, 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 my daughter knows the pelvic model yes. and mommy that is well, how yes. do you say that rectum this is yes. your rectum and my little one, my three-year-old goes, no, Savannah, that's your butthole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> listen, I don't think that's bad at all. It's wonderful. Oh, her showed me like pictures of like STDs and like genitals 
And then she was like, but this is this. And she, but she never told me this is what a vulva should look like. Mm -hmm. This penis should look like. She never said that to me. And she never, she never, she matched the, this is, this is what genital warts look like. Mm -hmm. with, sex should be pleasurable with someone who loves you, you know, and it, under the support of God. And that's, that was what we were taught. Right. And you, you can do it. You know, and there are lots of great evidence-based, faith-based sex education programs out there for people across the lifespan. I just want to say that um, because they're out there. Mm -hmm. Actively look for it. And I would encourage parents who are like, how am I going to teach my kids to not be a predator or a victim or you know, I want them to be a well, woke, sexually healthy person who aligns with the values that we believe in. Mm -hmm. Well, start with your own self. Do an assessment on yourself and your sexual beliefs and address those. And once you address those, it'll be a lot easier to teach them to your child. Mm -hmm. your kid. And if nothing else, I, I, I'm going to just do this plug for Peggy Orenstein. Again, this is gender bias, but again, it's great for all genders. Peggy Ornstein is a New York Times bestseller. She wrote this book called Girls and Sex. It's excellent. Talks about all of the concepts of um, religion, theology, um, pleasure for young young girls and sexual development. Right, that down, girls and applicable sex. Applicable for people of all genders, even if your child is trans, if you have a a son, whatever. Um, she has a beautiful, excellent po uh, podcast interview that was published, and I think believe in 2017. Mm -hmm. I I love that book. I have it on my coffee table, and it is excellent. I think it's a must read for everyone who has children. And I think, I think one of the things that you mentioned when you said your mom didn't tell you this is what genitals should look like, because that's a whole other topic. Oh, God. Every, I, just the same way that I walk down the road and it, I could see 10 people, I could stand next to 10 people and all 10 of us are going to look different. Your yep. genitals, all 10 of them are going to look different, more yep. than likely. You know, you know, your genitals are unique to you and you shouldn't have to feel like you've got to compare to somebody else. And that's a whole nother thing. It's like, you know, what well, does this look normal? And does that look normal? And I'm like, it's yours, you know, mm -hmm. body appreciation. I think too, with again, working with, with moms and, and, you know, some of my pelvic pain patients and everything, like, I feel like almost like that pregnancy because their body changes brings out so much because so many people become body conscious and then stuff starts coming out. You know, it's like yeah. not only just the body. Well, you know, now my genitals look like this and, you know, my husband won't want to touch me and this and, and like these women are just consumed with all this stuff. And I'm like, hold on, you know, love on you first. Like, like there's nothing wrong with you. First of all, like there is absolutely nothing wrong with you. You have to own that. You are beautiful. Own it. You know, I mean, own it. But there's so many people that are consumed by this. Well, I should, it should look like this, or I should look like this. And, you know, we've got all these moms like, you know, poor Tiana Taylor. God bless her. She's got a, a really nice body, bless her heart. But she didn't jack up a whole lot of women because there's so many moms trying to snap back and they're not snapping like um, that. No. They trying to snap back no. and bless their oh. hearts. <laughs> As like, my I southern little old, old ladies will say, bless your heart. Bless your little heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that you make such a beautiful point about body image and sexuality. And I think, you know, because in Bourbon Tales, my, you know, Instagram um, platform, you know, I, for those that don't know, I drink bourbon and answer people's questions about sex. And one of the questions I get, you know, I get pretty regularly, but I, I try not to publish it too much, but because, you know, there's so many topics we can cover. But one of them is, is vulva, genital body image, 
right? And, you know, you have people that say, like, I have a really fleshy vulva and labia, and it's not, it's weird, you know? And, or, or mostly, you know, partners might say, wow, you know, she has a really fleshy vulva, and I responded, and she became instantly insecure, and and I'm like, well, first of all, you reacting to that did not make her insecure. That preceded you. Um, and it's because no one told this individual that all vulvas are beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're all beautiful. They're all fabulous. Right? And it's just like appreciating your body as a whole. Mm -hmm. And, and establishing there's no standard of beauty when it comes to your vulva there's no or genitals there's no standard of beauty where it's your penis your scrotum your vulva your vagina there's no standard the standard is you know you accepting your fabulousness your sexy swag mm -hmm. and, and owning that and sharing that with your partner inspecting nothing less from yourself first and then your partner just needs to at least match that that's powerful for a lot of women. I know a lot of women here in this are, you know, they need to hear it Yeah. because I feel like a lot of women, it's, you know, and many of them may not say, but many of them feel like my son is upstairs running and sounds like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear anything. I can't hear a thing. Okay. Cause it sounds like horses racing above me, but, <laughs> I hear it. I but, hear it. but I think that, um, so many women, are you know they feel alone they feel concerned they feel consumed with all this information it's like again where do i go you right. know what do i do um i had a talk with someone recently and i was telling them i said you know um she was a, a an insurance-based pelvic health therapist and she was like you know it's so sad that you cannot put down as a goal patient can have pain-free sex and i said well sex is an activity of daily living you know it's a normal thing, especially, you know, it, it, whether, I mean, for all intents and purposes, period, but then even so in, in a defined relationship, I mean, my goodness. And so I was like, why would, you know, why, why would you guys have issues with having, um, you know, insurance cover that for patients? Cause it's just, it's part of life. And I said, you know, and you, you think about the social implications, the psychological implications, you know, if people aren't having sex, what's going on? Are they on the brink of divorce? I had one woman tell me, you know, I feel like if I don't have sex, she was postpartum, hormonal, no sex drive, you know, and she got to the point where she started to be worried about her marriage because she's like, well, what if he goes, what, what if he leaves me? But he, but she's like, but I have no sex drive. Like, I don't, what am I supposed to do? Like, she didn't want him to touch her. She didn't want him to, and, and it happens to a lot of women. It really does. And I think when it comes to sex drive, you know, I think there's a huge delineation between sex drive and motivation, right? And some just don't have a spontaneous libido to participate in sex at all whatsoever, but they might be highly motivated. They just don't have a desire for it. Right. And that's when I always tell people, if you can get yourself into a nice multidisciplinary practice where you have access to not only, you know, potentially a urogynecologist, urologist, um, OB-GYN who's subspecialized in sexual medicine, but also a pelvic health, physical therapist and mental health. And I really want to say, um, if this is one of the last things I say, when it comes to mental health and seeing a sex therapist, I just want to clarify a couple of things for people. A sex therapist isn't going to be in bed with you. Um, these are people who have their master's or PhD in family counseling or psychology, where they treat people who have anxiety and general, you know, they do cognitive behavioral therapy and all of the types of therapy, but they get subspecialty training in sex therapy, where they understand the historical physiological, biological, <laughs> sociocultural implications when it comes to sex. These are people who can give you advice, who can help redirect you, who can help you understand your history and how that is informing your current present self. And seeking out a sex therapist or a mental health provider does not mean that they're dis you're being dismissed. It does not mean that people think you're crazy. It means that we are addressing one of the many components that are really impacting your health and thinking that having low estrogen is the 
and getting more oral estrogen is this cure to sexual dysfunction. For some, for a small percentage of women, that helps. But for most of us, that's not the case. And there are many steps that we have to take in order to address that issue. And it may not be as simple as taking a pill or having surgery or getting your hormone levels checked. Yeah. I think a lot of people need to hear that. Yeah. Because the, the, the typical recommendation is take some estrogen. No. Yes. And <laughs> that's, that's not even the standard. Like, no. The recommend, recommended, you know, sexual health consult. I think it's, we have to look at what you're presenting with. Mm-hmm. It's really, truly individually based. But, you know, the narrative is so hard. It's harder to say, oh, I need to understand my sexual history. I need to kind of know where I learned these patterns from. I need to address this as an individual, but then as a couple. (laughs) I need to peel away the layers, and there may be a lot of layers, and maybe I don't want to peel them. Yeah, not a good look on me, but but you got to. Right. If you want to knock some boots and make it, you know, feel good, you might yes. have to. You might have to. Yes. Ah, pleasure. And it should feel good. Queen and everything in between. Good. It should feel good. It should feel great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So well, all that to say, I mean, ladies out there and guys, if you're hearing this, because this, this is for you too. You know, all this stuff is applicable to men. Um, but ladies, if you're hearing this, you know, one, takeaway number one, you are beautiful. Own it. Claim it, believe it, because nobody else can believe it but you. And know that there is help for, you know, these issues, especially as it relates to, you know, pelvic pain and and sexual dysfunction or difficulty, you know, whatever kind of difficulty you're having with sex for whatever reason, there are resources out there. There are people that can help you and know that you don't have to suffer because, you know, it should be a pleasurable experience for you. Yeah, absolutely should. So now if people wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? How, how can they get some of this fabulousness? Well, please follow me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I will be launching my YouTube channel in February. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So we'll have my typical bourbon tales, but also my docu-series that will be coming out. And it'll be a whole range of different type of folk talking about topics of sex and sexy time including my ni- very very nigerian mother so, nice um, i think you guys should do that follow me on all the social media platforms but then also you know go on my website i do um sexuality counseling um sessions i have clients i do it virtually um you know and in person if you live in the austin area or in the houston area and um check out my website send me an email I'm, I'm here for you. And I'll post all that stuff along with this video so that you guys can, you know, reach out to UC if you need her. Please, please, please don't hesitate. This woman is brilliant. Underlined, oh, so bolded, brilliant. exclamation mark, you're highlighted so it, you know, put it, <laughs> put some lights around it, fly it on one of those big balloons, like, so everybody can see it. Like, she's, she's awesome. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's so kind. I I thank you so much for including me. I'm just, I'm really happy to be a part of this. And I mean, you all are so lucky to have this brilliant human um, sharing her wonderful knowledge with you. So thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Until next time.